Simplex Canal. Tommy Ashton with Securitex. Don't go for Securitex. That's a mouse of time with Simplex with Securitex. Bill Walker is a future of American self design. Doug Rivers from Spring. Tony Jack with the President of Battle. Adam Graff with Jack Lee. Dave Clark with Response Fire. Steve Zachary, Simplex Canal. Some of the information that we passed at the January meeting, and I just wanted to run through it again real quickly, is that the uh, uh, our chapter, the Minnesota chapter of SFPE, is investigating the possibility of some type of foundation or scholarship in honor of Michael Kara. And we haven't decided to go forward with it, but the Board of Directors has asked the Board, and we report to the membership to do, is to identify what's available, how much it's going to cost, and is it feasible for our chapter to do that. So we announced at the January meeting that anyone that has any interest in serving on the committee, I think it's a three-person committee now, uh, we're going to contact some uh, some financial people, some attorneys, gather some information, and then we'll present it to the general membership. And that's probably a couple of months off yet. But again, the offer is there. Anybody who's interested or has some experience or knows of somebody that has worked with foundations or scholarships, uh, you can get a hold of me. Appreciate the uh, the heads up and the information. Hey Tom, who would that who would be qualified to apply for that? Would it be 
or or just his own town or be anybody or how I think anybody town really you know, because <laughs> we've never done anything like that before and I think uh, you know if you just look at the numbers to put together and ideally what we'd like to do is to set up some type of a foundation or scholarship for a student a high school student that's interested in pursuing a career in fire protection engineering uh, that's something that Minnesota's had a tough time doing is you know is, is keeping fire protection engineers here in town so I think that's one of the things that we can do to further that is that if we had somebody that's homegrown and we can assist in their education I think that would just benefit the entire community so that's what we're targeting right now now the cost and everybody knows what the cost of you know of education now in a, in a four-year school is so you know you're looking at something in the twenty thousand dollar range or thirty and then you know the interest and, and everything else that's accrued off of that you know would be given you know, to the student that's what we're thinking right now but you know the details I guess are just still something that we have to uh, we have to investigate so we don't know that's just all that we know but I think anybody who's got some experience or suggestions you know would uh, would be appreciated okay um, on the back table at the door as you just came in, uh, Bob James, who's with the Underwriter Laboratories, has dropped off some really neat information on UL. There's some great CDs there that have the, uh, all the, uh, the UL listings and all the different categories of all equipment. There's also information on field certification for UL and uh, phone numbers and everything. So you're free to take whatever you'd like or whatever you feel that would be uh, uh, you know, good for your needs. The information is. Uh, on the back table there. Um, Jim Walker, you can give us some information on the uh, the orders council, please. Okay. Get off there. How are we doing? So, okay. Well, well so everybody can hear me pretty well from here. Microphone? Uh, Microphone. Sure. Uh, I need that Father Tom. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Scott and Charles notes here a little bit too, so you have to bear with me. Uh, your governor's council liaison has been very busy at the executive committee meeting um, since the last meeting. Um, the uh, commissioner of public safety is getting more involved in our efforts, and um, there's a few things that are going to be happening this year that uh, you're going to see his involvement uh, more. Uh, one of them the International Co-Council, and, and also we're going to drag it into the 10th Annual Governor's Day uh, Fire Day at the Fair, which um, this year will be the uh, 10th Annual Governor's Day already, and it's like, I remember when we first got this thing going. Uh, unfortunately, Dan Bernardi is no longer with the State Fire Marshal's Office, so he's been kind of head manning it, although um, they have talked Dan into uh, uh, participating, getting involved uh, with the process again this year, and kind of assisting the council in the kind of a smooth transition so uh, hopefully we won't need Dan's self as much this year but uh, all the organizations that helped out last year um, will be looking for their help and support this year we'll need uh, many volunteers uh, we're developing some of the uh, programs right now but uh, uh, one of the uh, items we're going to try and do is get uh, a little bit more media there they had a kind of a contest with the uh, fire leaders, but who was it Explorers. Huh? Yeah, the Explorers. Well, what they're going to try and do is uh, get Eric Perkins. They tried last year, and he wasn't able to make the date, but he said he tried to make it this year. That um, they're going to do a bit with him as far as him participating in those uh, events, too. So you know, hopefully we're going to make him look bad and, and mm -hmm. us look good, uh, too. Uh, again, volunteers are encouraged to attend. Um, Scott is also a member of the Coalition Minnesota uh, regarding the adoption of the International Residential Code. Um, this September, the, um, the International uh, Code Commission is going to actually be here in September, and there's going to be a huge push to uh, um, resurrect the uh, residential um, fire sprinklers in the code, whether we're uh, victorious or not again this year. And even if we are, whether it gets amended out, as uh, Steve Zachert was uh, talking about a little bit earlier, it needs to be seen. but. Uh, we're going to try and get a big push this year because, um, like I said, it's I've already got the carpet upgrade in my house, so I'm, but I've also got my house sprinkler too. And it wouldn't hurt to see more houses sprinkler, but we all know that the uh, 
but the builders are, are going to be fighting it tooth and nail all the way, so we've got to be prepared for that fight. Uh, the Governor's Council on Fire Prevention Control, the 2007 <coughs> annual report, if anybody's interested in it, it is available. If anybody uh, wants a copy of it, I just have one copy here, but if they want to leave their business card with me, I can uh, make sure it gets emailed to them so they get, get a little bit of a read to see what the Governor's Council's been up to and also what their goals and objectives are for the next year here. Um, again, the uh, effort to require fire sprinklers in all new homes, uh, I've got some additional information on this. Also, if anybody's interested, please leave their business card with me. I will make sure that they get emailed all the information regarding uh, what they can do to assist, what their organizations can do to assist. And it also has uh, uh, some information on here on uh, the whens and wheres and, and how it's going to happen. So um, I said, just drop your business card off at the table right here. And I'll make sure you get that information. Um, Again, the building officials uh, are going to be there in full force too. So uh, they'll they'll be all all sides at these meetings. I'm sure it'll be a uh, you know a lot of kicking and screaming, but we'll see what happens this time around. Uh, let me see what else. Yeah. There's also another article if anybody gets a uh, Plumbing Engineer magazine, the uh, February 2008. Um, issue. There's an article in there on fire state safety statistics and the IBC code change proposals uh, regarding fire and regarding residential uh, sprinklers. And, uh, if anybody's interested in getting a copy of this, um, I've got this scan and I can also email it to them too. It's, it's a pretty interesting read you know, regarding the concept of balanced fire protection and um, knowledgeable as far as uh, the, I, I guess some of the logic that these um, uh, fire authorities are giving fire chiefs association, uh, particularly in California right now, on why not to sprinkler uh, buildings. So it's, it's it's kind of funny. But there's also another um, article in, uh, in th this one's in the um, oh this was in the October issue of um, oh what's a fire protect that not that PC magazine. Uh, no, oh, uh, contractor magazine. Oh, uh, yeah, that, yeah. I think it might be a spreader page. It's a. Um, I never read those. You never read these. But but it's basically um, some of the logic on um, uh, residential sprinklers and uh, and the absurdity, you know, as far as not having them, and he's basically. There's a little article that says why I'm against seat belts. It was before seat belt laws were passed. And it's a, it's a pretty sarcastic article. It's a, kind of a fun read as far as uh, you know, and how that came about. So if, if you want a copy of that, I've got that scan. You can get that too. Uh, last, that's regarding the uh, uh, Governor's Council on Fire Prevention Control, which I'm an alternate to. Scott's a made member. Uh, what I'm on um, is the Minnesota Fire Protection Advisory Council um, regarding um, upcoming legislation that's going to be proposed this year for uh, mainly contractors. And um, our next meeting is um, at March 13th at 1 o'clock p.m. Um, we meet at the Oakdale Fire Station. It's, the meetings are open to the general public too and some members to attend. And uh, some of the items that have been on our topic that we've been discussing that we've been trying to uh, rewrite the legislation on is uh, regarding local permits and inspection fees. We understand that there are communities that are double permitting or double feeing uh, contractors regarding um, fire sprinkler work. And so um, the committee is hoping to address that. So there's just going to be one fee. You won't see it. Uh, permit fee, a plan review fee, inspection fee, etc. You're going to know up front what that fee is. So when you write your permit, your permit check out, or if you're bidding the project, um, you'll you'll know what it is in advance, or it should be registered with the state. Uh, we're also trying to develop criteria for multi-purpose uh, water system, i.e., um, multi-purpose uh, sprinkler systems that serve both plumbing and fire protection. As far as uh, who can do it and what their uh, 
limitations are because if we're going to uh, uh, push residential sprinkler systems, that, that's one of the things that, that has to get ironed out and worked out too. Presently, there are very, I count on one hand, uh, the number of uh, uh, recorded installations in the state that have uh, combined systems. Uh, one of the manufacturers, Wurzbo, uh, uh, they've been one of the ones uh, behind this, but it hasn't quite taken off as, uh, as I thought it would, but yet, as, as long as there's no mandated requirement for sprinklers at homes, it's, it's not going to, but at some point should it, I mean, it has to be addressed up front. Um, licensing issues regarding consistency of the licensing, we're finding that there's um, possibly some gray areas or inconsistencies in the licensing laws right now that we're tweaking right now to, to get straightened up for everybody right now. Um, another item was review of managing employee <coughs> identification that suggested changes. Um, one of the issues brought up was uh, one of the I guess intense of the managing employee when that was implemented was that, that there was a go-to person should there uh, ever be issues um, with an installation or a design. But what's happened is that um, some companies have uh, multiple offices but yet one managing employee. So what we're trying to do is, is either keep the status quo or uh, it's been brought up to where if there should be one per office or one per so many employees, and that's still being discussed. So, um, if anybody wants to weigh in on that, feel free to attend one of the meetings. <coughs> we listen to everybody that comes up. Um, there will be another review of draft rule language addressing um, a lot of these actions. Again, uh, every time uh, a lawyer picks apart a document, you know, especially you know, a code, you know, whether it be, or, or something that's in the state of 299 am you know, they're gonna find something that's in there. And we're, we're just trying to tighten things up right now. Um, another item that we're addressing uh, right now that's uh, getting a little bit of feedback, a lot of feedback is um, AHA competency. There's been complaints from uh, contractors and building owners and other people that uh, it's not consistent statewide. And um, some contractors are complaining that the person who's reviewing their plant's installation doesn't know what they're looking at, but they know more than what they do. So um, that issue is going to be addressed. <coughs> However, if we're going to address that, then one of the other issues that we need to address is uh, not only the competency of AHJ, but also the competency of the contractors and also the designers. Uh, one of the things that may be brought up is um, having the, uh, uh, not only the fitters uh, licensed, but possibly having competency or licensing of designers too. So the biggest concern is that the level of fire protection design and installation hasn't been brought up to the level it should be with the previous rules, laws, legislation, we thought that that was going to help curb it. It has to some degree, but, but yet it hasn't. So and until we get something enforced to where somebody's going to sign up on the drawing for that installation, somebody's going to be ultimately responsible. Um, the State Fire Marshal's Office, I don't have that with me, but the State Fire Marshal's Office did a uh, review of all their plan reviews in 2006. Uh, regarding the, uh, everybody who submitted permits, or, or plans with permits, and rejection rate. And they were astonished at the number of times that plans came in two, three, four, five times before they were finally accepted. Granted, some of the smaller firms, the uh, percentage was skewed because, of, you know, if you're only, you know, putting out, you know, 20 jobs a year and you get, you know, four rejected, you know, there's a 20% rejected rejection rate right there, whereas you know, compared to some of the larger firms. But it still concerns them that they're <coughs> getting more rejections on it too. And the State Fire Marshal's Office is not in the business to reject plans. Neither is any uh, AHA having jurisdiction, any uh, private engineering firm. I mean, 
everybody's got better things to do than to keep looking at the same installation, <coughs> same plans over and over and over again. So, so we're hoping. Okay. So should that be charged by the hour? Well, some communities right now, they have one fee that includes two plan reviews. <coughs> Any additional, they're going to get charged. They want to try and get this consistent throughout the state you know, <coughs> as far as you know, competency. So there isn't, so, there isn't multiple you know, plan reviews here. So, I mean, we have a few other items that are up on the uh, docket right now that haven't been brought up. but. If anybody wants to be caught up to date or wants to be part of the, uh, I guess, uh, the law process, or the rules and regulations process, feel free to come. We meet the second Thursday of each month at the uh, Oakdale Fire Station, and that's the next meeting is March 15th. And that's all of that. Not sure of this guy. Um, okay, then with all of that, uh, I think we can move into our presentation. Um, and one of our presenters is here, I'm not sure why, but Adrian, do you mind starting off? Uh, I'm going to introduce Adrian Lloyd, he's the sales manager for, uh, for Micro Pack Protection. And uh, he's got some interesting information to pass along on optical weapon check. So, nice Minnesota waffle person. Adrian. <laughs> I live in the relative uh, warm Colorado, so it's a little bit, a bit chilly for me up here. But, uh, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, explain a little bit about our technology. Um, oops. So it's basically a visual CCTV flame detector. It's called it here, back on the table. Um, this is a camera that actually detects fire. It's been around for a long, long time. And those, those of you in the fire protection engineering community, as we start becoming more and more aware that there's a big drive in the NFPA to uh, <coughs> develop standards for vision or camera-based fire detection. We all know about smoke detectors, heat detectors, conventional flame detectors. But now the, uh, the technology is there, the processing power that we possess on our laptops and our mobile phones enables companies like ours to basically put a lot of processing technology into a device like this, and then we can analyze to see what's in the field of view of the, of the camera. So that's essentially what visual flame detection uh, is. So my presentation, I'll take about half an hour, then we'll give you a presentation on the uh, on the fire alarm uh, notification equipment. <clears throat> so CCTV flame detection, this is a new product, uh, a new version of a product that's been out on the market for about 11 years. As you can tell, I, I don't have a Colorado accent. I actually lived in Texas for 20 years. But I came over to the US in 1979 uh, with a company that uh, was involved in fire detection for offshore platforms. So I've gone pretty much full circle um, back into the hazardous area uh, flame detection business. Uh, up here in Minnesota, of course, refineries would be a classic example of where you'd want to put this type of technology and also ethanol uh, plants, of which there's very many up in this part of the, the country. So that's the product. I'm going to go and read all the bullet points, you can read quite clearly, hopefully from, from a distance. But essentially, we can see now we've got an FM listing, factory mutual, we've got a, a test standard that they test all flame detectors to. And this product, our model number FPS301, uh, will detect a one square foot pan fire of gasoline uh, up to 144 feet. So the sensitivity now of this technology is on par with uh, the conventional type flame detectors. Originally, we had a very limited distance of about 60 feet, which worked in very congested areas. But if you think about large open spaces that have fuel stored, like aircraft hangars, as, a, as an example, out of the Minneapolis airport, there are a lot of northwest 
maintenance hangars, and they, when they take the hangar in, take the aircraft in, there's fuel on board those aircraft. They don't suck the fuel out. Therefore, there is a high requirement to actually have automatic detection and suppression systems in every aircraft hangar in this country. So that's a very big market for optical flame detectors. How long will they before it actually triggers the uh, uh, our technology is a four second minimum processing time. And there's some video clips in my presentation which will hopefully give you a, an idea of what, how we actually uh, detect the fire. So basically we're looking for moving pixels. We have an image sensor which is a camera and we're looking for brightness that's joined together in the form of number of pixels that the camera is detecting and then basically our software says, okay, if that, if that profile of the moving pixels is similar to that of a hydrocarbon fire, it's bright, it's moving, <coughs> then we're going to process that and, and call that a fire. Uh, it sounds very simple, but it's taken almost 11 years to uh, perfect the technology in that product from over a thousand hours of actual video that we got embedded in our test bed that that detector um, has. So essentially we profiled a thousand hours worth of video frames of fire analysis and captured that to interpret that to put into our signal processor. So it's, it's taken a lot of, of time to make, make sure that this is almost a perfect flame detector. We in this room, our human sensors can basically we can visualize if we see a fire in a trash can there or a fuel spill, we automatically recognize that's a flame. This is a flame recognition device with software that's almost as good as human, a human being. We're posted a lot of applications, a lot of environments. Human beings aren't uh, there on fire watch all the time. So this, this technology basically takes, takes care of that. Typically in very hazardous, remote, offshore facilities this time. Adrian, does it have the capability of detecting different types of fires or different flames, or is it set for? It's really all hydrocarbon fires. Okay. There are there is a limitation. There is a limitation to all technologies. We can't see. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but we can't see the invisible type fires, namely hydrogen, methanol, and actually sulfur burning is very very. It's not it's not a bright orange yellow type of fire. So we can detect virtually the entire hydrocarbon series, diesel, propane, methane, uh, but when you come to the lighter fuel like the methanol, it's, it's, it's invisible to our technology. Uh, secondly, you can't really see my demo here, sometimes I hook it up to my laptop, but I've got a little monitor here showing the actual video image from the detector. So it's got a real-time color visual output, so you can actually use it for surveillance also. So for the same price now that the technology gives you for fire detection, you can actually take the video output and run that back into your control room, back in a remote facility, and monitor what's happening in the, in the area. We're doing a lot of remote video now over the, over the ethernet, over the internet, uh, so we can actually remotely monitor systems all over the world because internet IP addressable cameras are really a technology today. And here's a standalone device that got 24 volts powered, but typically you would have this interface into uh, a Simplex 4100U or, or a similar fire alarm panel as a relay contact closure, and uh, that would obviously be a listed approved uh, system because we've got our FM approval as a, as a fire detector. Uh, it's intelligent enough to know if, <coughs> excuse me, if there's an obstruction in front of the lens. We're monitoring the optical uh, integrity of the, of the lens itself. If we lose light, we automatically say there's something happening to the detector and we'll go into a fault condition. But also, very importantly, with this technology, unlike other flame detectors, the operators could actually turn on the video or watch the monitor and, and make sure that someone hasn't put scaffolding or an obstruction in front of the detector. No, if you shut the lights off. If you shut the lights off, if we put the lights out here, um, my present, on my presentation, 
automatically what you would see here is a gain in the brightness. So we're actually auto irising the camera. This is the uh, the recording camera there. So we can tell the difference from when you're handing it over just shut the light off. Well, <clears throat> so quite that easy. If I put my hand in front of it and keep it there, it will go into a fault condition. But that's no different from if this is a completely dark room, it doesn't know the difference. But it still can detect fire in a dark room. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to have the lights on for it to be a fire. So if you're off, you're going to a fault condition, but it's still detect That's exactly correct. You're saying, okay, I've got a very low level of light. That's a great question. So most of our applications are in, are in industrial applications, which are refineries, which never lose their lights. Right. But there is potential, yes, that if the light goes out, Unit would indicate trouble, but it would not override, it would still be able to detect the fire. So it was first introduced in 1997, um, 11 years ago. Uh, BP were the first user, we're a UK based company. Uh, and BP had a challenge, they said if you can develop a, fire, a flame detector that will protect our floating production facility uh, like that. Uh, we'll give you the business. So we did a lot of work for BP, and they came to us and they essentially funded the development of that technology. And BP today still are about, uh, um, we have about 60% of our business with BP facilities around the world. Petro Canada, uh, up in the north and the uh, eastern co uh, coast of uh, Newfoundland, were our second big customer in the year 2000. We got 166 of the forerunner of that product protecting the entire floating production platform of the Petro today. We've got, we've got over 4,000 detectors installed worldwide. This is basically highlighting the reason why it was developed. So we compare it to uh, products that would respond to reflections of flares, process flares, uh, arc welding, not wielding, uh, hot objects, engine exhausts. And we're not blinded by water or hot objects or sunlight. These are the challenges in most of the environments that we're in with conventional optical flame detectors. That's just a comparison. Uh, obviously, I can make this presentation available to anybody electronically. But it compares the various types of flame detectors and what potential problems you can, um, you can have. And the visual technology is, is this technology here. So according, apart from the optimum false alarm immunity, we have a live video output all the time, in real time. Uh, we can record the events. I'll go into recording in a second. Uh, that's a little video recorder there. So externally, you could have all the cameras tied back to, I think, Simplex, uh, Grinnell are involved in security applications too. So you have uh, DVRs that will record from all your surveillance cameras. This can network in to a digital video recorder so you can actually have recording all the time. We realize that's an expense to the user, so we developed with this product onboard recording. So we've got actually a little uh, a micro SD card that is inside of the uh, hazardous area rated enclosure, and uh, the unit is recording all of the time. If there is a fire event, if you see a fire, we actually store eight seconds of video and, and record that and dump that to the micro SD card. What that affords you from a fire investigation, from an insurance investigation, a risk assessment uh, uh, aspect, is we've now captured actually what happened before, four seconds before and four seconds after the fire. So we, we can now actually give a, a video output of what actually transpired that actually caused the, uh, the fire. A flange, a pipe leaking, a truck backing into a tank that is now captured in this device. We're, we're a camera, so now why don't we use the camera and use its capability to do onboard recording. So that feature is now embedded into this product. Video? Yes, uh, so, so you're, just so it's clear, you're not stating that that camera is UL listed to operate as a closed circuit TV security camera. No. It's no. just that it's there as a video signal That's so exactly that you can correct. see what might have occurred. That's exactly right. There was no listing issue, Tom, because 
We've got the FM diamond, we're approved to FM 3260, which is the ANSI standard for flame detection. So every other flame detector on the market in North America has the same approvals as that. But we've, we've got the surveillance capability too. Um, and you can use that capability. So you can go back and check the recording to see what might have what may have ignited that Absolutely. fire if there was a fire. We, we believe that a lot of end users and insurers would like that feature. Sure. Uh, so that, so and that's the only way we're able to kind of turn the prosecutor down the video. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. <laughs> 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 high, high hazard or even high uh, value liquor storage. My, in my past life, when I, I worked with Tom, I, I, I uh, sold Vesda <clears throat> air sampling smoke detection. And one of my last projects I was involved with was the Jack Daniels uh, distillery in Tennessee. Vesda now protects all of those. Uh, uh, warehouses because they had nine billion dollars worth of stored product and one the insurance company said if you lose one of those warehouses because they aged the whiskey for five years I believe <coughs> so there's a lot of product and this this technology is also applicable there and if there was a you know, high value uh, loss the recording is built into the, into the technology um, back into our industrial world we don't see reflections from flares, basically fires that are there all the time, as in the refineries here around the Twin Cities. Uh, we don't see the actual hot process, the plant itself. Turbines, compressors, hot engines. We don't see welding, cutting, and we don't see gas exhaust from, uh, again, turbines and compressors. Uh, other types of flame detectors are fooled by those types of events. So once again, we would develop, we develop this to overcome the, the uh, shortcomings of traditional type flame detectors. That's basically the specification, uh, 90 degree horizontal field of view. So essentially putting that detector up in the corner room up here of this room, we basically covered this entire room um, by using the 45 degree room angle. So all flame detectors typically have a 90 degree horizontal field of view. Most CCTV cameras have a 65 degree field of view. So we've got a special lens to give us that wider aspect, that wider field of view, because we're a flame detector. So that gives us the, the optimum coverage in most applications. And there's our certification. Uh, most uh, other type of infrared flame detectors, that's really our competition. Uh, are blinded by water because at the same wavelength that they're looking for, they're actually water absorbed at the same at the 4.4 micron uh, range. We're not in the 4 micron range, therefore we're not absorbed by water, which means in cold, arctic, wet, snow, ice conditions, you've still got flame detection if the, because we, we're not affected and not uh, visually impaired by water on the lens. So most of our uh, detectors are actually installed in icy, frigid, arctic, marine type environments. We do have a heating circuit that automatically senses when the temperature drops. will actually heat the optics to make sure that there's no icing on the lens of the detector. It just explains the, uh, the water problem that exists. But this is the limitation, as Tom asked, you know, what fires can we see? We can see every other fire, we can see burning paper, wood, or in class A type materials, we can see metal fires because they're very highly visible, but we cannot detect the invisible type of uh, uh, products like hydrogen, methanol, and so forth. So there is a limitation to, to this technology also. Um, back in the control room now, and again, a, a hazardous uh, plant uh, with traditional flame detect detection, all the operator knows is that those detectors went into the alarm, but it has no verification what, how big the fire was. Was it indeed a fire, or was it a false alarm? Was it something else other than a fire that, that uh, triggered his flame detectors? With uh, our original product, the operators got now the benefit of the visu visual confirmation. There's the fire. Early, the first responders know exactly how big the fire is. This could be in a warehouse, in a, in a locked-in building. You've got the visual verification. 
confirmation of what the potential hazard is for the firefighters to go in. Uh, this is how the oil, oil companies see the benefit of our product. On an isolated offshore oil and gas platform, they have a safe haven, the control room and the living quarters, they have a blast wall, and that's where they go if they have a fire. But now they've got a lot more information within a, a matter of seconds, four seconds, that that's the fire that they've got to contend with, or a small fire or a bigger fire. So that's what visual flame detection that's the huge benefit to the end user of the facility. And now with this new product, we've now got real-time um, color, uh, color, um, excuse me a second. We've actually got color ver uh, verification. This is actually in Windy Aberdeen, Scotland. That's one of our technicians that are lighting a pan fire. Um, but there's that, our technology in action. You can see how we profile the size of the flame, and that's how the technology actually works. It's a normal windy, cold, blustery day. That can even be in July, August in Aberdeen. Uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty cold, wet country. But um, that's, the, that's the, the color verification from that product. So now we can basically give a, give a color picture. I'll explain in a minute why there's a difference between the black and white and the color. There's the operator, there's Mr. Control Room uh, guy, basically now monitoring the hazard. So he's now got the verification, the visual <coughs> confirmation, there was the fire, there's the graphic that shows the fire panel triggered and shows where the location of the fire is, and there's the actual visual confirmation. Um, the two slides here essentially show <coughs> the secret behind the technology. This device is that we've actually got two image sensors. We have a color image sensor to give, them, give the, just the visual uh, picture back to the operator. But in the actual fire detection image sensor, that's how we detect the fire. So we're still using a black and white or mono sensor for fire detection. And these are actually video clips of them getting to work. Um, Anyway, there's another, another, this is another uh, clip of some very large fires that we've been involved with down at Texas A&M for the last three years. Uh, LNG has been around a long time. I know there's some LNG uh, facilities in, in Minnesota. There's a lot more LNG import terminals being planned and uh, built around the, the, the coastlines because we're running out of natural gas. And this is uh, our detector, our technology in action. Uh, on some very large LNG fires. That's a, uh, basically 3,000 gallons of uh, liquefied natural gas spilled into a pit that we've been trying and testing LNG detectors on because we've been doing a lot of LNG uh, work recently. So most flame detectors, the point of this slide is that most flame detectors are designed to detect a very small fire relatively quick, quickly. But no, not many flame detectors on the market have actually been challenged with those very, very large fires. So that's just to show you the, uh, the versatility. So that's basically how the uh, product uh, interfaces. Again, with the, the panel here, we use the relay contact. That will be an approved listed method of uh, monitoring that flame detector with that fire alarm panel. We can go to a PLC, an industrial control system with an analog output. And then you can send the video to the monitor. It is a 24 volt DC device. And that just shows you basically my setup on the, on the desk here. I'm just taking it into a monitor. Um, we use twisted shielded wiring for the video. We don't use coax, so we're not limited with the distance that we have in sending video. We convert that to a coax <coughs> in the control room. This is a bit more of a complex array. We've got multiple detectors. We have some installations with over 300 detectors on one facility. So when you've got that many detectors and that many live uh, video clips that you've got, video images, the only way that you can process all those video images is by basically uh, multiplexing them. And then the second slide here shows you how we can then monitor over a network and display any camera in any installation anywhere over the, uh, over the internet. And that's basically today's security technology. You, you, you 
can have remote monitoring anywhere with, with IP addressable cameras. So the, these devices now are IP addressable with this device here. There's your conventional file on panel connection. That's the analog connection. <coughs> uh, this is the challenge that we, uh, BP, uh, uh, came to us with, said, if you can ignore that, which is basically the reflection of the flare on that offshore installation, you've got our business. And that's basically how we came about, said, 10 years ago, by ignoring the reflections for that fire that's there all the time. Uh, no other flame detector on the market can ignore that. They'll basically see that as a fire because it's infrared being reflected and they'll be in a long condition. And today with oil price that this morning touched $100 a barrel, uh, these facilities will not want to shut down due to a false activation from, uh, from flares. So our, our product is in, in greater demand today than it was 10 years ago because again, the high, high oil price. That's one of the facilities for ConocoPhillips, one of our big customers. Uh, that's off, offshore Indonesia, and uh, that's producing over 250,000 barrels a day. When our technology protects all of the other process area on this facility, these are called FPSOs, the floating production storage and offloading facilities. Essentially, that's a tanker, and they put an oil and gas processing facility on top of a tanker. So they store the oil, so there's no pipelines, and a, a shuttle tank that comes up and offloads the oil once or twice a week. So that's really the technology that exists in oil and gas, and that's where our technology is being mainly employed uh, because of the, the, the challenge with the flares. Uh, this is another problem with uh, offshore or outdoors, and even in Minnesota, we get, we get some bright sunny days. Um, this is where we've actually rejected the, 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 uh, the reflection of the sun on water. That, to most infrared flame detectors, is a fire, and they will typically desensitize themselves to that. So that's basically uh, our technology, how we ignore things that can actually affect other types of technology. That's the, uh, the net effect on an offshore installation. Uh, that's just basically a sample of uh, the co companies that we sell to primarily oil and gas companies. There's a multitude of applications for our technology. In, in addition to oil and gas, we've been involved in uh, New York and the Lincoln Tunnel in some fire detection testing for road tunnels uh, with the NMPA Research Foundation. And recently we've been involved in some uh, aircraft installations. This is a, a gas, new, brand new gas processing facility. This is actually the fire tests that the uh, Port Authority use in the Lincoln Tunnel to test, uh, to uh, uh, practice on basically the car fires. That was taken back in November up in, uh, in New York. We've got some Coast Guard hangar installations. And very recently, my two colleagues here, that, uh, Ben and Travis, that work for the local rep company that sells our product, uh, we're, we talk about ethanol, uh, ethanol production. It's a uh, big, big, big business these days. And we've recently been selling our flame detectors into facilities like this for ethanol production. Uh, I think that's going to be a continuing and growing uh, business for quite a few years. Basically, that's, that's my presentation. There was another presentation to follow, so I appreciate your, uh, your indulgence. And I'll, I'll be here, obviously, at the end of the meeting if you've got any questions. And I've got brochures here on the table, too. Thank you. new in the market that actually embedding very similar technology in cameras 
but to detect smoke in atrium-type environments, or hangars, or large hotels, where you've got smoke building up and beam detectors are limited in some applications. That's, the, that's where the, the industry is moving to towards. But UL 268, the smoke detection standard, doesn't address vision-based cameras fire detection. The NFPA Research Foundation is driving the need for a standard for optical vision-based fire detectors. It's a good along with the client's question, Adrian. If you were a designer, an engineer, then design over the installation CCD flame detection system, uh, how would you test that? What sort of criteria do you use presently to test that system? Oh, to test it well, that's a good question, Tom. We had a test simulated for it. So we could obviously light a fire, but in most applications you really can't do that. To actually verify that the detector is functioning, aligned, except that we have actually a test device. But often the challenge is this device and would actually activate it and test it. And test it. That would be part of the device. That's exactly right. Marty, how are we doing? Uh, this one, just one more minute. Okay. Oh, you're fine. 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 you are fine 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 you on the, uh, the fire prevention and the fire industry in Minnesota. It's unbelievable. So, do yourself a favor. If you got some time, and uh, Steve, who's the, uh, uh, the chairman of this, uh, of this organization, is more than happy to walk just groups of people or individuals through and just answer any questions. So, feel free anytime to avail yourself there. Um, are we good? Is that mine? Um, okay, we got a few minutes. You want to bear with me or you want to go ahead? I'm cutting off a lot of my screen. His projector is on top of my computer, set up a little bit different. We okay? No, it looks good. It's pretty great. Awesome. Fire away. Where are you? Where are you? Let's go. Let's go. Enhancements in notification and fire detection. What we want to talk about is excuse me, hey, excuse me, Marty. This is Marty Weeks, Central Cornell. You're supposed to be up here first. No, I can do that first. I do it from here. He's with our marketing R and D group. He's been with the company for 40 years. This is what he does. <laughs> <laughs> You've had to say that. Yeah, You've had to say that. Well, well, we still got to do more before we start. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about notification, and we're going to kind of uh, lead into uh, nest notification. That's a buzzword you hear a lot. You know, especially with the Virginia Tech uh, tragedy and, and things that happened with the military. And I'll give some little history on that. I also want to talk about a new technology, not a new technology, but a, an application where we're using uh, CO to detect fires, to give us a better or faster detection of fire. So um, that's what we're going to cover here. And what I have <coughs> up front is my uh, my new large screen display, which is enhanced put over the 2x40 lines, uh, LCD. We have a large screen that gives more information at one time. And by the way, it's bilingual. I can have different languages over here, even double byte like Chinese and Korean and so forth. Uh, connect this panel to a uh, display board, which everybody's you know, used to seeing around the facilities, wherever, in our advertisement uh, notices. I have a general non-alarm type message. But this is unlike other ones in that it's powered from the fire alarm and it's also uh, receiving information about the fire alarm if there's a change in status. So it could be anything. It could be a bomb threat. It could be a terrorist threat. I can display from the panel. I can trigger certain messages, messages that are embedded in this sign. And they can be different messages and different signs throughout the facility. So you can picture having this over the doors, giving people direction, what the emergency is and what to do in response to that emergency. That's the kind of connection we have up here with our head on. Get along with my notification devices. <coughs> I have here a diagram of uh, two addressable circuits. One for detection, or initiating circuit, signaling line circuit. This is something we're used to seeing with uh, 
problem today. Uh, large systems, particularly, they have addressable devices. Um, it also could be input output addressable. We're adding another uh, layer to that in that the notification is addressable. This is what I'm going to talk about addressable notification devices. So, the same benefit that we received years ago by having addressable initiating devices, I can now have notification devices on my fire alarm system to give me a lot of flexibility in how I control those. Global addressability. So introducing the TrueAlert multi-candela addressable notification appliances. These are strobes or strobe form combinations. We also have strobe and speakers. Speakers are not addressable at this point in time. It would be wired back to a conventional Mac circuit. Well, I have multi-candela in that I can have it 15, 30, 75, or 110. And I have a jack typically used to change that candela. But I have another position that's called FACP. That gives me the ability to set the candela from the program of the panel. So I can put all my devices on, go back to the panel, and I do my programming to the system. I can also set the candela of what that light is going to be for that particular location. Will it be notified so on the device so the fire department can see what it is? Or the That's a good question. I got it covered in a couple of different ways. Uh, the other thing that the addressable mm -hmm. devices uh, affords us is the ability to uh, determine the voltage drop voltage drop uh, diagnostics, which will uh, alleviate the need to go through when you first power up the system to ensure that all the devices are going to work, you will look at the worst case scenario, and that's when you voltage down the lowest point. That's when you discharge batteries. Um, I can do that through algorithms built into the software to ensure that it's going to work in the worst case scenario, allevi alleviating the, the need to go through and go through that exercise of waiting 24 hours for your batteries to come down, and then throw the system in alarm. So great benefit, big time saver. Another thing with addressable notification appliances, unobtrusive testing. I can go in, because they're addressable, I can select a device and test it. Either a silent test where it's recorded back to the panel, or it can be just that one device will momentarily flash, not the whole circuit. So we can go through a facility during regular working hours and, and test the system. That's what happens when I program the system or set with the plug and I can have a report that shows me by address, by location, description, label, what the uh, Candela setting is. Does that answer your question? How about when the inspector is walking around and say, what's the camera? Okay, that's another one. Got that you cover there too. The magnet test. Okay? We can go with a magnet. We can put the, uh, that particular circuit that these devices are connected to. I'm going to test them now. I'll put it into a code. I'll walk through it. I'll test it. I'll hold a magnet next to it. And when I hold a magnet next to it, it's going to flash. It's going to give me the, uh, by flashing rate, it's going to give me the candela setting. There's a little LED right in that, right in that lens that will flash. Not the whole strobe. You go blind after a short time. <laughs> no, there's a small LED in there that will flash and let me know what the candela setting is. Do you think the inspector will accept that? Yeah. He's got the report, and he's got that LED flash and telling him. And if that doesn't work, you can always go back and move the plug around to set the candela manually like the conventional ones are. All this drop diagnostics. Great, great time saver. I'm able to go in and put this into a diagnostic when I first install the system to ensure that it will work under worst case scenario. For those who are not familiar with the difference between horns and strobes, well, strobes are power devices. If you drop the voltage, the current has to go up because they're fixed power devices. And as the voltage goes down low because your batteries are discharged, it's going to add to the effect if you have to go a long distance because now our current's gone up. So I can do a, a simulation when I first fire up the panel to simulate that low voltage potential and then ensure all the devices are going to work. Again, if they don't work or they have the potential not working because of long wire runs or not large enough wire, it's going to give me a, a report like this will let me know which device is, is going to fail. I'd have to go back and rewire or maybe put a larger wire in there. Now, to, to help us in designing before the job is actually installed, the uh, project engineer for the company 
will go through and use this software. And this software will actually go through and, and identify your devices, how far they are from the panel, what size wire you're going to use, so you can simulate the actual installed condition and ensure that they are going to work according to this program. And if they don't, they'll give you a, a fail indication. It means you have to do something different. Increase the wire size again, or reroute your wiring so you don't see that. That goes hand in hand with that software algorithms in the panel if you install it to ensure it's going to work in the worst case scenario. Any questions on the uh, multi cam addressable notification on the strobes? Moving on to mass notification. New solution. These are two new solutions that we have. We have a uh, amber uh, strobe. Now, does anybody can tell me in here why do we have an amber strobe for mass notification? Where did that come from? Amber alert. Sorry? Amber alert. Amber alert? Hmm. Maybe. Uniform Not force there. criteria? Yes, United Facility Criteria. This is a government uh, code or standard that says that you would use a amber. This is actually two services, the, the Army and the Air Force. The Navy has accepted either or, but they want to alert, okay, for the clear uh, lines to still fire. The other aid to mass notification that can be applied with the fire alarm system as well is the, the reader board. This is a true alert message appliance. And we have UL listing on it. Okay, to your uh, answer up there, we have the United Facility Criteria Code, our standard, and this that dictates uh, everything to do with buildings. And this is this is a result of what happened with the uh, embassy bombings in Africa. And later you had the Al Kobar uh, towers, where you can, if you remember the story there, uh, a truck pulled up with explosives in front of the building. There were sentries on the roof, and they uh, they looked at the situation. They said, "Hey, this doesn't look good." The guy, the truck driver, was running away. They started running down through the building to notify all the occupants. That took some time. They didn't get to everybody. So that's when the military said back that we had to come up with a better way to notify the occupants of a facility, a complex, a university, of any kind of life-threatening situation. It could be weather, it could be a terrorist, it could be anything. And by the way, the new standard that we're talking about, NFPA uh, 72, 2007, makes reference to mass notification systems, makes reference to its definition, and right now the description is in the annex. Later it will be moved, the next rendition of this will be moved into um, uh, Chapter 12 for mass notification. So it's coming our way. Just gives you an example how it ties in so many different things. It could be uh, computer monitors, it could be phones, PDAs. Uh, there's uh, a lot of different ways and it's really a system that's customizable to the particular facility or the owner, what he wants to do for mass notification. Fire alarm system really sits there in a good position to be kind of the center for that because what is it? it's a passive system but it has all kinds of safeguards, battery backup, su uh, supervision, all the circuits. So it really lends itself to be part of that mass notification, a very integral part. Because a lot of things that they are trying to do right now, mass notification, popping up on your computer screen, okay, a banner that says, uh, we have a terrorist in building such and such. Well, that computer has to be on. Or what if the mains power went out? So all these different things could happen. Yes, they're nice. They're very uh, helpful in facilitating getting that word out, but the good old fire alarm system is there as a, as a, as a mainstay that's going to be there under the worst, really worst case scenario. Simplex <laughs> Grinnell is at the forefront of improving mass notification. They have the text monitor, they have uh, the means to do through. Uh, uh, Wheel on Cooper, the uh, uh, giant voice in the sky type of scenario, wireless connections. Uh, of course, we have integrated voice in our systems. We have two way fiber telephones. And uh, we now have just released the uh, Amber Strobe that complies with the uh, military requirement for mass notification. Would the alert uh, characteristic to be the same as the 
location of the firestorm? That's a good point. We had the same, we'll talk about it in just a minute, but it has the same restriction or requirements as the uh, clear stroke does. So it has to meet that same standard. So visualize this, you'd have two side by side. With probably a horn, probably most likely a speaker associated with it. Are they giving something so you can have one device and just off and use it? We're working on it. <laughs> Cooper Will apparently has one, right? So it's a few pieces put together, but it, yeah, it is. It's one piece. One device. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, again, my, my point about the autonomous uh, fire or control, whatever the control may be, it, it should be autonomous to cover all the different uh, ways in which you get that word out, that message out, the mass notification. It's a central point where you can uh, have pre-recorded messages, uh, remote messages go out, or it could be a place where you would do your, your, live, your live messages from that uh, center console. Again, this shows how our uh, mass notification system, this is a uh, safe path uh, from a Google wheel off interface to our system. They do the interior. They do also a wireless connection to the giant uh, voice in the sky. And this is where the uh, uh, 2007 version of NFPA, NFPA uh, 72 is uh, describing in the definition area, describing mass notification, so it's embracing this. So we had standards, started that with the military, now NFPA is picking up on it, and they're incorporating that into their, uh, their firearm standard. Base-wise strategies may involve a lot of different things, you know, covering the outside area, wide area notification, your fire protection, of course, your fire alarm could be the, uh, the heart of the system, looking at the perimeter control. All this is tied back to encompass the complete uh, scenario to cover the mass notification uh, requirement. Simplex controller. Let's go forward, not backwards. Visual notification, emergency messages and non-emergency messages that, that I have up here. If I have an alarm in my system, <coughs> bomb threat, and it gives me a message as to what to do in that case. I clear the alarm is going to go back to my non-emergency non message. The non-emergency message, we'll see in a minute where that comes from. The emergency message is embedded into the software of this computer uh, board. Now what I have up here is my single line circuit with initiating devices. This is my addressable circuit, my smoke detectors, and my manual stations connect to. In our system we call it the IDNet channel. These sign boards connect to that same circuit. So I'm going out to an addressable circuit, pinging the uh, different sign boards, they each have an address, I can pin up to 32 different messages that are embedded in that sign. And they can be different messages for different signs. In addition to the uh, signaling line circuit connection for control, I also have to have power. Well, I have 24 volt power coming from the fire alarm panel, battery backup. Now I have an Ethernet connection on the reader board. Ethernet connection would connect to uh, the facility LAN, okay, and then it have computers that would have a special software that would enable them to find what that non-alarm non -alarm type message would be on the reader board. Would that affect the, uh, if you just take those on there, would that take away from the addresses of the industrial system? No. These, these are coming in to the uh, reader board because each reader board has an IP address. In addition to the embedded address it has for the system, it also has a reader, uh, I mean, uh, an IP address that the LAN is connecting. <coughs> and we can have multiple computers can visualize. Maybe in a cafeteria you have one connection um, going to different signs. Maybe at the principal's office, he's going to be connected to all of them. Okay, he can define what's what uh, messages would be displayed in each and every one of them. 
So it's uh, very flexible in, as to what messages it has control of changing those messages. There's dimensions you can see up here, and typically the uh, visibility is up to uh, 100 feet. As I mentioned before, 32 embedded messages. We have one that we'll use up as a blank message. Why do we have a blank message? Because if you were to lose uh, your AC power, that means that the power off the batteries, so as not to drain the batteries faster than what we want to, uh, we'll take out the uh, LEDs and make them blank. So this is a uh, full UO listed fire alarm system. And it meets the uh, 1638 for fire alarm. That means a supplementary notification. So you doesn't, this does not take the place of scrolls throughout the facility. This is in addition to it. Again, uh, in addition to just the uh, application for fire, the meth notification is also very applicable in areas where you have um, uh, high ambient noise and cannot have all the device over 120 uh, decibels. So you can have something like this, maybe the stroke to get people's attention. Then the, the reader board can actually mimic whatever the voice message would be going out. You can have a scrolling message like we have right here, welcome. And uh, to the uh, Minnesota uh, Society of Fire Protection Engineers, we can have that scrolling through. It would kind of mimic what our voice message going out would be saying. Uh, this this sign, this reader board, was developed in uh, alliance with a uh, company called Inova. I know they're very big in the transit business. They have all kinds of experience there. In fact, they uh, when they came in. Gave, gave us an overview of the product. They talked about 9-11 and how they were able to, through their systems, uh, divert people away from the White House when they were heading to go to work through their sides, the different train stops and so forth. They said, go home. So they will put that on their side. So we have the same kind of idea here. You have general, non alarm type information, but when you have a fire, you have some kind of mass notification alert, we can direct people where to go and uh, how to uh, stay out of harm's way. The amber, the amber scroll, this is, um, again, unlike the reader board, this is under the same uh, standard as the uh, clear strokes. This has the same requirement as far as light intensity and what area we cover. So the same thing will apply. It can be anywhere from 15 up to 110 candela. And we would place them probably typically in the same places where we have our, uh, our clear strokes for fire. <coughs> and the same things go on. So typically from, from what we understand, uh, we're not really sure how it's going to come out eventually, but it's, the idea is that when you have a fire, and then later you have a, a, a mass notification alarm, your fire signals would stop then your mass notification would begin. What is that? It could be that the visuals stay on. So you have both the fire, clear scroll, uh, blanking, um, scroll, and then you have your uh, amber scroll. Then your voice would change from the fire message to a, a um, other type of message as, as far as maybe no police ability to take shelter in place, whatever the emergency may be. So we're not really sure how that's going to play out because some people are saying, Stop all fire alarm signals and let the mass notification because the mass notification has priority over fire according to the new standard that they're about to uh, uh, bring into place. Okay, any questions on the mass notification and reader boards and uh, strobes and See, Mark, just to build on that last point, one of the reasons why mass notifications can take priority is, is in the scenario where someone pulls the uh, fire alarm and the shooter is waiting outside the door. That's a good example. And the same thing back to Alcott War Towers. When there was a truck out in the front, they could have walked in to the, uh, the, the lobby and pulled a manual station to bring everybody out to the mustering area in front of the building, and it would have been blown up. So, um, that's why, when you think about it for a minute, that's why the mass notification has to take precedence over the firearm. 
Yeah, at Simplex like Grinnell has been doing this for at least the past 10 years on a number of military installations around the country and the world. Uh, we're recently, right now, we're finishing up one over at Fort Snelling at the 88th Regional Readiness Command. And we have a number of colleges that are budgeting for it right now. Unlike the traditional, what some people think is mass notification might be a PA system, uh, the only way you know if it works if you, is if you use it. Where this is, uh, what was the word? Supervised. Thank you. It's a supervised fire alarm system that some people will actually set up with the speaker rate to, to use the Windsor Charms at noon. Hey, you know the system's working. Otherwise, if there's a problem somewhere, anywhere within the facility or the campus, you know right away because the fault will come back. Very good point. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Carbon oxide detection, uh, I believe, Minnesota is one of the states that requires this at any sleeping areas. Okay, you're all aware of that, that requirement, how you apply it. Uh, the group room or near the particular source of the carbon monoxide. But you have to do that, okay? Over a certain level of carbon monoxide over a period of time, you have to pull an arm, okay? Uh, we have that facility right now. We, we, we partnered with the system sensor for gas detection, cellular uh, uh, interface module that allows it to connect to our addressable center line circuit, and we can monitor that as a appropriate arm. The next step uh, in the code, you're coming up with a Another temporal type code, temporal four. We have temporal three as a standard for fire alarm. Okay, the new new uh, new code will come out and will uh, identify temporal four as a uh, as a toxic gas alarm. Okay, so all these states uh, throughout the U.S. and probably more come online all the time will be using this for toxic uh, gas detection for CO. Why CO for fire detection? Anybody have any idea why we would think about using CO for fire detection? Smoldering fires. Hmm? Smoldering fires. Because smoldering fire is a good source for CO. You're going to have CO basically mm -hmm. any carbon type fire. You're an expert on fire. We have CO gases being given off of any kind of carbon <coughs> type fuels burning. And particularly uh, a smoldering type fire. You don't have a flame yet, just have smoldering. And uh, what's unique about the the, uh, the CO, okay, it's not full like some smoke detectors. Some smoke detectors will be full thinking there's smoke, but it's not smoke, it's vapor, or maybe uh, electrical smoke, or dust. Another good uh, uh, feature about the uh, CO that lends itself to detection better than smoke is that you don't have heat barriers, you know, smoke will rise up until it matches the, uh, the temperature of the, of the air. So if it cools as it rises, it's only going to go so far that it will level off. Maybe your detectors on the ceiling will never get to it. It won't punch through that heat barrier. Uh, whereas the, uh, the CO, the CO mixes completely with the air and will fill the room. Another thing about the CO, they've done tests where you had a, a closed room with a door, and out in the hallway you had your detector, and you had a fire inside the room, and uh, smoke to get out in that hallway would take a long, long, long time, if ever. But the uh, CO detection took place because the gas went under the door. It mixed with the air, and that air that went under the door was able to be picked up by the uh, detector in the hallway. So, good benefits about it. So we have this device, we're about ready to release. This is our um, smoke detector in this case, but it could be a heat or it could be a combination of smoke and heat. And the base is fitted with a, a, a CO uh, electrochemical cell. And this cell is uh, connected into our addressable point so that it can be picked up individually or can be picked up as a combination, depending on how you define that point. The features of the uh, CO sensor base offers a single hardware solution for both your toxic gas detection as well as enhanced fire detection. Basically, we can set it up for either a faster response to the fire or more reliable response to the fire. We have that flexibility. By the way, UL has no standard for testing the CO. So we, we cannot have a CO 
smoke detector or, or fire detector by itself. It's got to be combined with a heat or photo or a combination of heat photo. The elements can be changed just like our smoke gun. We have a prop. We can pull out the uh, sensor and then replace it. It does have a limited life. It's six years, but after five years, we'll give an alarm that needs to be changed. So that will be uh, uh, printed out in the test report or uh, service report and show <coughs> where those sensors have to be uh, replaced. So there's no standard for CO fire detection. What do you use in your product? When does it detect enough CO to say there's a fire? We have, to, we have to meet the requirements of UL for the either heat or, or smoke. And they have that window of 0.5% uh, smoke oxygenation to 4%. So we have to fall in that window. So it's really uh, taking that window where we have a smoke detector, say a photoelectric, and we have our, our CO sensor. And what the CO sensor is doing, it's in one case maybe, uh, I'm not an engineer, but uh, when they talk about, there's two ways we can define it. We have a photo and we have a, a, a CO sensor. It's going to look at, is there CO element here? So I take my, my, my photo and I move it closer to that 0.5, the more sensitive area. If I would make it more reliable, okay, it does the same thing. So it, it plays around with the, uh, the sensitivity threshold that I have for my photo but it doesn't leave that window that you all say you must play within. If I see 0.5 or, or 4%, it's got to activate somewhere in that window. So there will be a true output that is CO being detected. Is it going to be a separate output that CO is being detected in, in that area? It will for the toxic. If you select it for toxic okay. and for fire detection, so there's no there's no uh, criteria no standard from you all to say <coughs> certain you know many parts per million of uh, of, uh, of CO I'm going to give an alarm. It doesn't have that. So it's got to play within the, the heat range or the, the photo window that I have, which is 0.5 to uh, 4 percent. People like what parts per million of CO needs fire. How, how many parts per million? How quick is it for a CO, for a CO fire today? No, I missed something. It's uh, going. It's going to see a, a CO component. So, for instance, let's so if you have the obscuration and CO, then it alarms. So it's more reliable. That's that's my point. Oh. I can have obscuration from 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 vapor from from a, a fake smoke, but I I won't uh, have the same uh, confirmation with my CO sensor. My CO sensor will confirm that yes, what you're seeing, photoelectric detector, is really a fire smoke. It's not. It's not a a, a, a moisture thing. Give me your example of the fire in a room behind a closed door. How did your CO fire detector detect that? Oh, it's not detecting the CO. <laughs> didn't you? Didn't you say that? Yes, I yes, did. That's I, a good point. Well, Marty, at a certain work. threshold on the CO detector, doesn't it transmit a supervisory condition of a high level of CO? I don't, I don't know that. This was an example that was given by, oh, by the way, this whole theory of uh, the CO detection, this, this is just like yours, that they started in the UK. Uh, they've been doing it for 10 years now in the UK. And that's one of the scenarios they gave us. We can detect the fire outside the room. Well, that's, that's true. This is brilliant. That, that, that's, that's a good point because, you know, it's I don't true. think we'd ever see smoke outside in the hallway because it's got to go down under the door and out. Yeah. 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 So I guess I think the confusion is as to the CO detector, can it determine when no. it comes in if it's smoke UL, or if it's actually the CO? UL, will, not let fire. Us, UL will, will let us do it for the toxic and then for the, the fire part of it. It's got to have some element of smoke there. It's got to have some element of yeah. smoke. It could be that it's down you to the You can't send a fire alarm on CO only. Yes, but maybe that's yes. probably yeah, yeah. you should change it. Not yet. No, not yet. But we need to know what is the level of CO in what span of time when there's a fire problem. And this we don't have that yet. Well, that's not that Fire? Yeah. The knowledge that they're passing on to me is just telling me that I can make it more reliable. I have a point that I can make it more reliable as far as detection, or I can make it more uh, uh, faster, faster response. Well, I'm sorry. It doesn't say anything about the numbers of the parts per million. 
It doesn't give me that. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for stopping me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's that has these two uh, options to our CO optical combination. We talked about that, and uh, of course, uh, uh, combined with the photo, are these the heat for uh, detection? So this is the, the four things I was talking about. Gas sensing, the cost of gas sensing, this is the 75 parts per million over a certain period of time. And then you have the enhanced photo for fewer nuisance alarms. And then you have the enhanced photo for accelerated detection of alarm. So one's making it more sensitive, the other one is pushing the sensitivity out if it doesn't see the uh, CO. The elements can be changed without changing the base. And that's it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Marty. Any questions for Marty? For, you know, yes. um, will that uh, CO uh, detector, it does come in a sounder base, too? Yes. So you, you, that's precise. Yes. Actually, uh, the footprint is the same. In other words, it won't fit in a, a smaller base that we have, but it won't fit in this size base. You can see this has a sounder. Yeah, you can see it. So this is good for uh, warm rooms or whatever. Yeah, one, And Adrian and, and Marty both, are your presentations available as a PowerPoint that we could download or make available or yes. print out? Or yes, yes. Only take it now, I can give it to you. I have one on stick. Super. And Adrian, I think you also make the same. Great. Okay, we'll try to link that on the website too, uh, as we get it all set up. Um, and that's it for our meeting this evening, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for all of that.